Welcome back after the break. Uh, before we went for our break, we were looking at, uh, you know, uh, uh, building people who are, uh, uh, you know, part of the kingdom of God. So kingdom building is not about uh, just building an organization, a big church, but uh, kingdom building is uh, all about uh, building people. And uh, we also saw this uh, in the life of uh, Paul. Uh, let me just uh, present the... Okay, it's not coming on, just a minute. Okay. Are you able to see? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Does this help uh, by putting up the notes? Does it help? Yes. Okay. So he's, uh, we're looking at uh, Paul's life and, uh, you know, how he uh, values people, treasures people, keeps them in their heart, and he's willing to even live or die together for them. Um, you know, if uh, Paul was standing before God on the final day, you know, he will not boast about all the great things that he has done, the journeys, the missionary journeys that he's made, the books that he's written, uh, you know, the uh, the people that he had trained, the churches he had established, uh, but he would rather boast about the people whom he uh, served. So look at what he says. Uh, it's on your screen, First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19 to 20. He says, what is our hope, joy, or crown of rejoicing? Uh, it's not even you in the presence. Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and uh, joy. So the people whom he served, the people whom he ministered to, the people whom he brought into, uh, you know, uh, uh, the grace of God, the salvation of Jesus Christ, you know, that what that is what he's going to celebrate and boast. That is going to be his joy, his glory, and his uh, crown. So, you know, look at uh, Paul, you know, even though he's accomplished so many things, uh, we see that, you know, the core of what he was doing uh, were uh, the people that he um, ministered to. And I think uh, that is the heart of a um, leader. You know, if we see even in the, in the life of Jesus, you know, um, uh, just for one instance, we read, uh, you know, when uh, Jesus and his disciples were very tired, he said, okay, come, let's go away to a quiet place and rest. And they take a boat and they go to the other side. And even before they reach that place, they see a multitude of uh, people, uh, you know, uh, come from all over by foot. They, they know where Jesus was going towards, you know, they, the word just passed and they come and what does Jesus say? He doesn't say, oh, no, you know, we're already tired and exhausted. We've come here to for a vacation. We've come here to rest for some time. And, you know, these people don't seem to leave us. But it says that, you know, uh, he was moved with uh, compassion and he was moved with compassion. And what does he do? He has people, you know, seated and uh, he's, he teaches them. And then uh, it's almost going to get e uh, be evening. And the disciples come and say, send them, send them away. You know, where can we? Uh, and Jesus says, you know, you provide food for them. Where can we provide? So for so much uh, food for so many people, take us 200 dinars, you know, to buy bread. Um, and then we know that Jesus multiplies the five loaves and uh, two fishes. Okay, so um, 
we see the heart of uh, Jesus for uh, uh, the people. You know, uh, we also see the heart of uh, leaders like uh, Moses. You know, um, uh, Moses was very hesitant to take on uh, that role of leadership, but uh, you know, he goes when Jesus said, when God says, "Okay, I will send your brother Aaron." But uh, we see when you know they're journeying in the wilderness and. Um, and uh, you know, God tells him at one point he's so fed up with these people's grumbling and murmur, constant grumbling and murmuring. And uh, God says, "My presence will not go with you because if my presence goes with you, then you know these people will not last. They will not live because I'll wipe them away." And uh, we see that you know uh, uh, Moses could have thrown the towel and said, "You know, okay, God, if you're so frustrated with these people, then I'm just human. How can I put up with uh, their constant bickering and their murmuring and their complaining and their gr grumbling and them wanting to kill me as well? Uh, give me a break. Why don't you choose some other leader? You know." But we see that you know Moses doesn't uh, you know stand out. He steps in. Uh, again, and he intercedes uh, as he has done many times. He intercedes for the people. He asks God for forgiveness, and uh, you know, on behalf of the people, he stands in the gap. And even now, he says, "Your presence does not go with us. You know, don't send us from this place." And we see that you know he buys God back, so to say. And God says, "Okay, Moses, I'll come along with you." Uh, but we see that Moses could have given up. But you know, he's he. Why does he not give up? Even though these people were so stubborn and stiff-necked and hard and rebellious uh, and so many of them the whole day they would be standing in queues just for you know for their with their petty things uh, to be sorted out by Moses and Moses patiently doing it day in and day out it's because you know he had people written in his hearts now when people are written in our hearts uh, no amount of uh, jealousy and hatred and uh, you know what they throw at us uh, how they treat us uh, will not stop us from you know uh, pursuing God's call in the midst of them and doing what God wants us uh, uh, to do. So we see that, um, you know, uh, uh, as a similar example in the case of, of the Apostle uh, Paul as well. He writes very beautifully here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Can somebody read that, please? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or do we need, as some others, epistles of conduct? commendation to you or letters of commendation from you. You are a epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. Thank you, John. So here we see that, you know, where are people written? They're written in the heart of uh, Paul. So he says the people he ministered to were written uh, in his heart. He carried uh, them in his um, heart, you know, and what was the result of him carrying them uh, in his heart is, you know, when he carries them in his heart, uh, you know, uh, he has the approval uh, of God, you know, uh, and we see that you know uh, the Holy Spirit uh, works uh, in and through His life to minister to uh, the people that He's uh, ministering to. So He's saying that you know uh, these people are written in our hearts, not with ink. That means uh, it's not in the natural. It's not by natural means. That means anything done out of uh, you know uh, selfish motives, uh, you know pride. Uh, you know, anything that has to do with the carnal nature uh, is by natural uh, means. And that is not going to actually build people. It's not going to edify them. It's not going to have a lasting impact on their lives. It's not going to transform uh, them. But if we are ministering to people with the power of the Spirit, by the word of the of God and to the power and the enabling of the Holy Spirit, the anointing, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, then we see, you know, uh, is what we see, the result is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is great, it's uh, uh, lasting, it's powerful. Uh, because, uh, you know, people will be empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will work in their lives, will uh, will establish uh, God's purposes, God's call, uh, uh, will activate the gifts, uh, will act 
connect with the seeds of faith in uh, the lives of uh, the people that we are uh, ministering to. So the work of the Holy Spirit produces uh, you know, change, transformation, the lives of people. And hence, we need to depend on um, uh, the, the work of the Holy Spirit and not on, uh, you know, our carnal nature, the things that we do out of our own will, um, uh, you know, because when we allow God to write people on our hearts, then he gives us the ability uh, to write into their hearts. Very important. It's on your screen, page number 64, uh, the last paragraph. It says, it's only when we allow God to write people in our on our hearts. That means when people become valuable to us, important to us, uh, irrespective of who they are, whether they are constantly commenting, constantly giving us feedback, uh, constantly, uh, you know, uh, saying negative things, being a hindrance to us. We know they don't like us, whatever it is. You know, we are ministering to a group of people who, uh, you know, have all kinds of uh, people with all kinds of attitudes. But if we still are willing to write them in our hearts, if we value them, we treasure them, then, you know, we are giving God uh, the permission to uh, giving us the ability to, uh, you know, uh, to write into their hearts. That's when we can speak into people's lives. We can decree uh, into uh, people's life and we can see the Holy Spirit uh, ministering and working in and through their uh, uh, lives. Just as we are, um, you know, called to build people, uh, we are also people. And even as we give um uh, out, you know, even as we feed people, even as we minister to them, we also need to be ministered to. So, you know, if people are uh, pointing at us and telling us things we need to change and how we need to do things differently, then we need to, uh, you know, be willing to take feedback, change, uh, you know, if our senior pastors, if our senior leaders, if, um, you know, uh, uh, women and men of God, you know, if they point out something and teach us something, we must be humble enough to receive correction because it says in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, uh, as iron sharpens iron, uh, so a man sharpens the countenance of his uh, friend. Okay, so we look at a few practical uh, keys to building people by um, uh, the spirit. OK, um, so when we are building people, uh, uh, you know, we are, we need to be mindful that every person has a specific calling, a function that God has given to them in the body of Christ. And according to the function, uh, God has uh, entrusted them the gifts uh, and the grace to fulfill that specific uh, function. So we need to see where uh, or discern. Uh, and this discerning comes with discerning of the, the spirit. Uh, ask the Holy Spirit to help us to discern, even as people come uh, forward to minister in church, in different uh, leadership positions, or in different, uh, uh, as volunteers in different groups, we need to uh, discern their God appointed place and their God appointed uh, functions. Uh, because we know that every member has a function in the body of Christ. and um, you know, even as we are individual members, we have individual functions uh, and the gifts and the grace of God to uh, enable us to use that function uh, for the edification of the church. You know, we need to build up people and we need to be able to see that. And we can see that only through the power of the Holy Spirit that is working in, our, in and through our lives. For example, you know, Jesus, when Simon Peter was brought, uh, was brought to him, he looked at Simon and he said, uh, you know, you shall be called Cephas, uh, which is translated stone. And later on, he says, you are the rock on which, uh, you know, I will build my uh, church. OK, uh, so, you know, he just spoke into his destiny, his uh, calling. In the case of Nathaniel, uh, we see that, you know, when Jesus saw Nathaniel coming towards him, he said, behold, an Israelite uh, in whom there is no deceit. Uh, OK, so uh, even as uh, we are overseers of the, sh uh, the sheep that God has entrusted to us, we're shepherds of the flock that God has given to us, you know, um, we need the Spirit's enabling. And that is uh, that comes when we are in communion with the Holy Spirit. We are 
tuned to the Holy Spirit uh, to understand, you know, um, what is that person's calling uh, and train them uh, and uh, equip them in that in their calling and release them uh, at the right time. OK, uh, we also need to position people to release their divine God given uh, potential. Um, or we learned, uh, you learned in the first year, you know, in fulfilling God's purpose for your life, that, uh, you know, that uh, God takes us through times and seasons. And, uh, you know, uh, to different times and seasons, uh, we need to position ourselves right to receive God's uh, favor, to receive God's provision, to receive God's uh, providence, and also uh, to prepare ourselves uh, for the next season uh, in life. So, you know, um, uh, even as we uh, minister to people, whether it's our youth group or a children's church, or you know, whether it's your team, you know, the the leader of a volunteer team in your uh, in your uh, church, uh, or you are a pastor, you are a leader, you have your own Bible study, or you have your own youth group that you're ministering to. Uh, you know, you need to um, uh, uh, discern uh, through the Spirit's leading uh, the times and seasons that people are in, and you know. Uh, minister to them uh, likewise because different people are in different times and seasons uh, so we need to prepare them uh uh, show them how to understand the times and seasons so you can take them through the book fulfilling God's purpose for your life receiving God's guidance uh, you know and prepare them for the next season uh, of their life so that they can launch out uh, for the next season and God can use them mightily so let's look at an example here you know um, Joshua, Joshua was always before you know always with Moses uh, we see here in Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 38 uh, you know God telling um, Moses Joshua who stands before you you know uh, that means he's always there with you he's always there besides you it says encourage him uh, for he will uh, you know lead uh, Israel uh, into the promised land so we see that you know um, Moses encourages strengthens Joshua so that he can uh, lead people and we also saw that a good steward is someone who is able to identify leaders and uh, equip them and build them uh, to take the work uh, forward so you know Moses knew he might, he is not going to enter the promised land which already God told him because uh, uh, you know instead of sp uh, speaking to the rock he strikes the rock and God says you will not enter the promised land and when God tells him you know train up Joshua he begins to train him um, up in the case of uh, Barnabas and Saul we see that you know Saul the first uh, when he uh, becomes um, uh, he, uh, you know, he's uh, has this encounter with uh, Jesus on the road to Damascus, you know, um, uh, and he starts uh, slowly, uh, you know, preaching and teaching. But many of them are still afraid of him. The church has not accepted him fully because they think that, uh, you know, he's just playing up with them. Uh, and, uh, you know, he uh, also there's a lot of persecution that he's facing uh, in uh uh, the places that he is in, uh, in Damascus and the other places. Uh, so we see that, um, you know, he goes up to Arabia where he, uh, you know, he receives, he learns from God himself, receives much revelations. Um, and so the first 17 years of life, Paul's life are silent years. But we see that, you know, Barnabas, uh, you know, he goes to Tarsus, he looks for uh, Saul and um, um and we see that, uh, you know, he brings him to Antioch and for a whole year, you know, they preach and teach uh, the people. Uh, and then we also see that, you know, uh, uh, Barnabas goes along with uh, uh, Saul or Paul, the Apostle Paul, on his uh, first missionary uh, journey. So uh, we see that God using uh, Barnabas um, to affirm to the people that, Yes, Saul is uh, transformed. He has accepted Christ. He's now part of the church and also how he works alongside Paul in the uh, ministry. Okay. Sometimes we can make a mistake of, uh, you know, wrongly judging people, not discerning the call, the potential that God has given to them. Uh, uh, a case here in Paul's life uh, is uh, with John Mark. John Mark is uh, is Barnabas' cousin. And uh, during the first missionary journey, when Paul and Barnabas go on their first missionary journey, they take along with uh, them John Mark. Uh, but when they uh, they uh, they come to um, uh, 
uh, you know, Perga in Pamphylia, you know, for some reasons, John uh, says he's not going to continue the missionary journey along with uh, Paul and uh, Barnabas. So they leave him uh, there and they continue. But this was in the mind of Paul. I think he was very angry and disappointed uh, uh, and thought, you know, Paul, John Mark is not uh, fit for the ministry. And then we see when they launch out into the second missionary journey, uh, you know, uh, Barnabas says, okay, let's take my cousin John Mark along. And and uh, Paul, uh, you know, does not agree. And there's this, you know, there's a sharp um, uh, 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 contention between both of them. We read this in Acts chapter 15, verses 36 to 41. And uh, sadly, it resulted in a, a division where Barnabas takes John Mark and goes on his missionary journey. And uh, Paul takes Silas and goes on his second uh, missionary journey. But later on, I think uh, Paul has heard the great work that John Mark is doing. And he realizes the mistake he makes in judging him wrongly. And then, you know, uh, he takes him on in his team. And John Mark becomes one of the team members of Paul. How do we know this? We read this in Colossians chapter 4, uh, verse 10, when he's writing to the church at Colossae, you know, uh, Paul says, um, uh, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, uh, also greets you. That means uh, he's there with John, uh, with Paul when he's writing this epistle, so he sends his greetings to the church at Colossae. And First Timothy, when Paul is writing to uh, young Timothy, who he's left at the churches at Ephesus, to oversee the churches at Ephesus, uh, he says, you know, only Luke is with me, get Mark and bring him with you because he's useful for me in the uh, ministry. So we see that even though Paul made a mi mistake in judging uh, John uh, John Paul, I was going to say, <laughs> in judging uh, uh, John Mark, you know, we see that, you know, he still, he, he still rectifies his uh, uh, mistake and um, you know, he sees himself, uh, sees John Mark as someone who's uh, useful in the ministry, takes him on in his team and, uh, you know, ministers along with him. So sometimes we can make a mistake in, uh, you know, judging people wrongly. Uh, at those times, we need to correct our mistakes and also, you know, work alongside them. OK, um, we also need to discover and develop uh, the people's uh, gifting. Um, you know, uh, all of us are gifted in different areas. Uh, so we need to help people know what is their gifting, what is their, uh, how do they know what is their gifting? First, find out their uh, function or find out the talents, their gifts that will help them know what is their purpose, their calling, their function in the body of Christ, and they can use their gifts uh, and the grace of God that comes along with it to fulfill that specific uh, function, okay? Uh, the important thing is even as we are kingdom builders, even as we are building up people who are, you know, um, spiritual stones or living stones, uh, it's important to know that, you know, uh, we don't just uh, build people through uh, the prophecies and revelations and how we train them. Uh, we might be excellent life skill trainers, leaders. Uh, we can have good leadership qualities, traits. You can have the charisma. Um, we can we can have the gift of speaking and uh, wooing people uh, and all of those things but the greatest message we will uh, we will ever preach is our own uh, life and that is what paul says you know even though he accomplished great things in first corinthians chapter 4 verse 16 and first corinthians chapter 11 verse 1 he says imitate me even as i imitate uh, christ now that's a bold statement to write to say uh, to the churches at Corinth uh, saying, imitate me. That means your life should be such an exemplary life. Uh, you know, that Paul is saying, imitate me even as I imitate um, uh, Christ. Okay, so it's important that we live um, a life example so that, you know, the people that we are ministering to can imitate from our lives, can see uh, Christ's likeness in us. And so before we even uh, preach or teach, we need to be people who are doing it ourselves, as we read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Can somebody read that, please? It's on your screen. Matthew 5, 19. Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Whoever therefore takes one of one of the least of his commandments and teaches men 
also shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and preaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, Jeffina. So who is great in the kingdom of heaven? We've already looked at this verse. One who not only teaches, but also does. Whoever does and teaches, first does and then teaches, shall be called great in the kingdom of uh, God. Okay. Um, you know, uh, Matthew chapter 15, verse 14, he says, uh, they are blind leaders of the blind. And if blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Okay. So... Uh, in this context, what does it mean? It's basically, you know, when when um, uh, you know when we teach people a revelation that we have not received ourselves, which we have not understood ourselves, which we have not, it's not become a reality in our lives. It's not become a truth in our own lives uh, by which we live. Uh, and when we uh, teach it to others, it's like a blind leading the blind. And we know what happens when a blind person leads another blind person. They will eventually fall into some pit or ditch or, uh, you know, some place where they can hurt themselves. So there are a few important statements that are made here. And I like to uh, read it out. Okay, it's very, very important. You cannot give something you do not have. Okay, so if you do not have, uh, you know, uh, if you do not know the truths in God's word, uh, you cannot preach it and teach it because you cannot give something that you do not have. And you will be preaching something that is stale and, you know, stale things people don't really like. It's not going to give life. Um, uh, also, we cannot give something you do not have is when you do not uh, are not meditating on God's word, you're not in love with God's word, you know, you cannot impart uh, uh, fresh new revelations uh, from God's word, from what you have received. And also our ministry is our... Um, is our overflow with our intimacy uh, with God. So if you have not experienced uh, God's love, his peace, his joy, you cannot give that out to uh, people. Okay, if you have not experiencing God's power in your life, the anointing in your life, you cannot give that out yourself. You cannot take others to a place where you have not gone yourself. Okay, so if you're not growing from, uh, you know, into more of Christ likeness, from one level of glory to another level of glory, from, uh, uh, you know, to being spiritually mature, you cannot take these play people that you are leading also uh, to that place. You cannot enable people to mature in Christ likeness if you are not maturing into Christ likeness uh, yourself. Okay, and you cannot release people of. You know, you can pray for them, but there will not be any bondages that are broken, uh, yokes that are uh, broken, uh, if you are in that in bondage in that area yourself. So if you're speaking, if you're praying for somebody who is in bondage to um, anger and you yourself are, you know, uh, a person who gets angry and... Uh, or, you know, somebody who's filled with pride, jealousy, hatred, or, uh, you know, strongholds in your mind or some temptation, you're praying for somebody else, then, you know, you can't uh, help them to overcome their bondage uh, or administer liberty or freedom or a breakthrough because you yourself are not set free in that specific area. So even before we minister and uh, preach and teach, it's important that, you know, we come back uh, to these sentences and, you know, uh, assess ourselves where we are. These are like really powerful sentences, these uh, four sentences. You know, it's important for us to come back to read this, uh, uh, to review it in our own lives, to take stock of our own lives to, you know, by looking at these sentences and judging where we are ourselves. Okay. The other thing we need to do when we are ministering to people is avoid insecurities. Um, you know, sometimes we're very insecure as people, um, you know, and when we become very insecure, we can be over controlling, uh, we can be judgmental, sometimes authoritative, dictatorial. Um, and this is something we need 
to uh, you know uh, take stock of avoid and be aware of just like for example King Saul you know when uh, they killed the Philistines and they uh, and David came um, you know all the people were dancing and rejoicing and they started singing a song and said you know Saul has slain his thousands but David his ten thousands and Saul was very angry and uh, we see that uh, you know, it displeased him. And from that time on, he had his eye on uh, David and he tried every means to kill David. Even when David was playing the harp, um, you know, this, uh, the evil spirit would come on uh, Saul and he would play the harp. And, you know, times we we uh, we read in, in scripture that, you know, uh, Saul would cast his spear uh, and he would say, you know, I will pin you, uh, I will pin David to the wall and we see that uh, David was constantly running uh, for the fear of fall uh, Saul he was running away from um, Saul okay so it's important for us to take note of our uh, heart attitudes whether there's pride jealousy hatred bitterness anger uh, you know that can lead to be us being authoritative uh, uh, you know, bossy leaders, over-controlling people, uh, which is not being a kingdom leader. And that's not what God wants us to do because God is not a king or he's not a leader in that sense. Okay. Uh, it's important for us to maintain a pure heart uh, and the right motives, not only towards people, but also because before God. Okay. First John 4 says, uh, if we say that we love God and hate our brother, then we are a liar because we cannot uh, when we cannot um, uh, love our brother whom we can see then how can we love God whom we cannot uh, see okay another thing that we can avoid when building people ministering to people be, is being overprotective uh, being over controlling you know sometimes uh, leaders pastors control every uh, area of people's life you know uh, everything from the things that they have to buy to the vacation what they want to do with their children with school they want to put their children in I recently heard one of our uh, uh, you know one person who's joined APC recently they were part of another church and it was so sad to hear how controlling the pastor was and you know the pastor had control over every area of their life you know uh, which school to put their children in what to buy you know um uh, which uh, whether they have to go for vacation or not or which place to go for a vacation how they're spending their money you know every area and uh, you know they come out from this whole thing so traumatized uh, so disappointed uh, so be controlled by this one pastor this leader and it was uh, uh, very very sad to hear and it's, uh, it's something that is overwhelming something that is so difficult to even to understand that there can be somebody uh, like this, okay? Uh, and also we need to be avoid uh, jealousy. Godly jealousy is fine, you know, uh, Paul talks about, he says, for I am jealous in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, but he says, but I'm godly jealousy, you know? Uh, not that uh, uh, I'm jealous that uh, people are coming and teaching you. Of course, he's worried about them hearing the false doctrines, the false teachers, uh, but he's saying, I'm writing this and I'm saying this because of, um, uh, I'm not jealous of others, but there's a godly jealousy, uh, you know, that I want to protect you as uh, as people who, uh, you know, um, uh, should not go away from the truth, okay? Um, so even as we um, guide people, even as we lead people, we need to be careful that we are not controlling their every aspect of their lives, who to marry, who not to marry, what to buy, what not to buy, where to study, where to go, who to speak to, you know, uh, being manipulative, uh, how to spend their money. Uh, everything in their homes has to be told to the pastor. That is not the right kind of, uh, uh, the, you know, being shepherds of the flock that God has entrusted to us. Avoid over-involvement. Uh, you know, it's important that we teach people what is right and wrong. We let them make their decisions. Uh, if, uh, you know, people should be left to their own uh, to make their decisions, even if you're counseling them, uh, show them, you know, what are the options available or let them think, 
you know, basically counseling, why do somebody come, why does somebody come for counseling is because they feel that they have lost their own uh, willpower to fight the problem, the issue, or uh, they, they, they have lost all their, uh, you know, uh, hope in life, or they can't see a way out, but there is a way out. And we need to empower them uh, to see, find a way out, empower them that they can do, there is a way out, there is a solutions. And so, you know, slowly get them to think, you know, uh, build that confidence back. So you can ask them, what do you think can be done in this, uh, in this situation? And I'm sure, you know, they have not lost their mental faculties of thinking, of judging, of knowing what is right and wrong. They can say just that they need help, just that they need that confidence. And once they start thinking for themselves, then, you know, they come to a place where they are they're growing up, they're learning that they can cope with their own problems, that they, they don't have to, uh, you know, depend on you as a crutch. Uh, if it happens, then, you know, you are the person who's going to feel overwhelmed, um, overburdened, because there's so many people calling you in and out, so many people wanting to meet you, time, endless times of just hearing people's woes and troubles, when you can just empower them and, uh, you know, equip them to, uh, you know, uh, build their own lives, to find their own solutions and manage their own uh, things and their own um, lives, okay? Uh, the next thing is avoid uh, being overly authoritative. I've already given you uh, some examples. Uh, avoid emotional attachments can be very dangerous, uh, you know, especially, uh, uh, you know, when you're very attached to people, uh, you don't want to let them go if God has something for them in another country, in another place, uh, you know, a calling where they can go and uh, they can establish their own ministry, organization and church. We don't want to let them go because we see that uh, if they leave, then, you know, we are going to lose a worship leader or a worship pastor or, a, you know, a youth leader, a youth pastor or children's pastor, somebody is, is good in this area. Uh, uh, a missions leader, you know, we won't get anybody like that. But, uh, you know, it's our responsibility to train people, equip them. But when we sense that, you know, they have a calling and God is calling them to go somewhere else, then, you know, we release them, we bless them, uh, we let them go. We don't build up soulish attachments. That's a dangerous thing uh, to do. Okay, uh, an example given here is First Samuel chapter 18. We know that Jonathan and David were very good friends, but when Jonathan uh, learned that his father was all out to kill David, um, then he comes to a place where uh, he warns David and also lets uh, David uh, go, even though they were uh, good friends. Okay, any questions so far? Anything anyone has to say? about building people, what we have been speaking so far, building people in the spirit, uh, how to have people in our hearts, some practical keys for building uh, people by the spirit we looked at, and also we looked at things that we need to avoid. Any questions on these? Anyone has any questions? Okay. If not, we'll uh, move on. Okay. The next thing we need to do is bring correction uh, when required. You know, sometimes as leaders, uh, we avoid uh, correcting people because we think it will unnecessarily cause up uh, confrontation, um, uh, it will, you know, just um, bring about a very uncomfortable situation. It will spoil the relationship. It will hurt the relationships. But, uh, you know, it's very important that uh, when we see things that, uh, that are not right, that we confront them, but we do it uh, in love, um, you know, because uh, we love the person, but we don't... Uh, we don't agree to uh, what they're doing is uh, that they're doing is uh, wrong. So you know we do it in a loving way. We um, uh, we correct them in a loving uh, way. We don't delay in bringing uh, the correction, and uh, you know uh, 
uh, and we need to also pray about it and ask the Holy Spirit to enable us, speak through us, um, you know, um, and we know that every correction brings a, a certain amount of discomfort, a pain, restlessness in the other person, uh, you know, um, and also will change things a little bit. The person might not take it very positively. The person may get angry. The person may, uh, you know, uh, the relationship uh, can change. The equation of the relationship uh, can change. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, at those times what do we do okay um you know at those times don't take it um, too personal we'll just look at that in a bit okay we'll come to that um you know how we can uh, what do we need to do before uh, you know when a person doesn't take correction before that we will just look at uh, you know uh, correcting people in love in gentleness uh, um, in patience, uh, like it says here in this, uh, all of these verses on your screen, Galatians chapter 5, you know, uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, you know, um, uh, First Thessalonians, Paul says, we were gentle among you uh, as, uh, uh, as a mother, uh, you know, nursing her own child. Uh, and then Paul is writing to Timothy and he says, uh, choose a leader uh, and the leader must not quarrel, but must be gentle to all, able to teach and uh, patient. Um, and then, you know, um, he's writing to Titus and he's saying, speak evil of no one, uh, be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all um, men. Okay, so we're called to do things uh, gently, peaceably, uh, and in love. Um, and we see that, you know, even when as Paul, who is an apostle and the leader of many churches, you know, um, uh, he uh, most often he beseeches people, okay, uh, rather than commanding them. So he uses this word beseeching or beseech you, brethren. Uh, or oh, I beseech you, beloved, uh, in Christ Jesus. Uh, he uses this beseech 24 uh, uh, times. And this word beseech basically in the Greek means uh, to call near, okay, uh, to uh, that is to invite, uh, exhort, uh, pray with. So beseeching is basically, you know, you're requesting that person, you're trying to find out, uh, you're calling them close, you're not doing it in public, you're not correcting them in public, you're personally one-on-one -on -one, uh, meeting or one-on-one -on -one interaction with them. You're trying to find out things, interrogate, find out what has happened, what is going on. And then you're making a request, you're asking, uh, you know, it's a, it's a desire to just correct the person, to make the person, to, and also the person to know that to desire to, you know, just help the person in what they're going through. And also, you know, it's basically exhorting them, encouraging them uh, to do the right thing and praying uh, with them. Okay. So we see uh, some examples given here. Uh, uh, but the word uh, command, you know, Paul uses it. Um, very sparingly about four times only while well, he uses beseeching about 20 times but command he just uses it only four times and command is basically you know sending out a message uh, it is the command it's a charge that they have to uh, keep so very rarely uh, does Paul uh, command people but you know when it's a very important thing that's when he commands but most of the time he's beseeching them which means he's calling them close you know he's just you know, finding out more details uh he's just pleading with them requesting them asking them and also uh, praying with them okay so what we need to do as leaders is you know, like paul did you know beseech uh, more than uh, command okay uh, because command can always uh, you know, cause a person who's trying to even do the right thing uh, to go to step on the wrong foot, uh, to go the wrong way. Uh, but if you're beseeching them, you know, exhorting them, encouraging them, then they most likely will change and do things uh, differently. 
okay now uh, we need to know that when we correct people not everyone will you know be on a positive note everyone will not agree everyone will not take uh, your correction um, very very easily um, there can be some negative uh, responses um, and it can be very painful and very disturbing and hurtful, especially when it comes from people who are very close to us, people who we love a lot. Uh, but, you know, uh, what are some of the negative responses we receive? People who complain, uh, you know, they're constantly, you know, once you correct them for something, then you see that, you know, suddenly they change in their behavior towards you. Uh, they start complaining about every little thing. They pull up things at the the past, you know, they make it a big issue um, and everything is, uh, you know, they do everything uh, to put you down um, and they feel that you're restricting them, controlling them or hurting them. Uh, some of them can even withdraw, you know, they totally disconnect with you. They don't want to look at you. They don't interact or communicate with you. Uh, so, you know, when you are, uh, you know, handling such a person or moving around with such a person or in the midst of such a person then you need to be you know you're very conscious because you need to be very careful because anything you say can trigger off something uh can hurt them even more can bring up the past it can you know the volcano can so uh, erupt and things like that so you know you have to be on like tiptoe very careful uh, sometimes there can be a retaliation uh, people can blame us for the problem uh, they can be disappointed and, uh, you know, frustrated and, uh, you know, dissatisfied and they can throw back at you and, you know, and all can end up with uh, a lot of disrespect and dishonor that, uh, you know, at one point of time they had so much of honor, respect and love for you and all of that can just, you know, can go down and drain, okay? Um, and then eventually some people can even leave, uh, they can walk out of the ministry, the church, your Bible study group. Uh, they don't want to come back. Um, so what do we do? In these are the responses of various people, and I'm sure we've all faced one or more of such reactions. But what do we do in such situations? We don't take it personally uh, because uh, our motive, what was our motive? Um, if our motive was right, our motive was to correct the person uh, so that the person does not end up uh, in a mistake, in a fault, uh, you know, our motive was uh, to reach out to them to ensure that they don't go on the wrong path, then, you know, if they retaliate in the wrong way, then, you know, it's not uh, your fault. Don't take it uh, too personally. Look at what um, Paul writes to the church at Galatia. Uh, the Galatians church, you know, um, Paul had labored among them. And uh, he felt that his labor, that he had labored among them was in vain, was going in vain. Uh, because, you know, after he has preached the gospel to them, uh, he has left that place. And, you know, people uh, who were there, who come in, you know, were trying to uh, tell them, uh, you know, they had to keep the law, the Old Testament law and all of those things. Um, and so we see what, uh, you know, uh, Paul writes. He says, you know, um, uh, in verse Galatians chapter 4, verse 12, the last phrase, he says, you know, um, you have not injured me at all. I mean, just so powerful. You know, um, uh, these people, you know, Paul would have heard all that things they must be saying uh, about him, um, questioning his authority, what he thought. Uh, now, you know, the people were turning him, turning this, the churches in Galatia away from the truth to keeping the Old Testament laws, following these Jewish fables, myths and mythologies and all of those things, keeping the circumcision ritual. Paul was saying, all oh, this is not uh, needed, but just see what he says. You have not injured me at all, uh, which means he's heard some negative reports, some things that people have said. But, you know, Paul is not hurt because he knows that, you know, um, uh, you know, these people were actually, um, you know, these people were actually, um, it's not their mistake. It's because of these false teachers and them misleading them. And so Paul is taking that measure, the corrective measure to step in and to minister to them. And uh, he's saying, you've not hurt me at all. Now, there is, um, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, from Barnes' commentary, uh, there's a note here. You can read uh, what uh, Paul is basically, you know, what commentators are saying, what Paul would have actually meant. Uh, so you can read that uh, later on. Okay, we'll move on. Um, so what do we do when, you know, people, when we correct people, give time for people to change? Okay, all of them need time to assimilate things, to understand things, to process things, and to move on. Um, you know, if they uh, want to leave and move out, you know, um, let them go. Uh, just keep praying for them that God would, uh, you know, reveal the truth for them, reveal your heart for them, uh, bring them to an understanding, and also, you know, uh, bring them to a maturity in all areas. Because we know that they have been immature, uh, even as they leave the space, go to another place, you know, they will be welcomed there, they will be treated nicely. But again, you know, the old habits will come out. There'll be somebody who will point out, you know, so pray that, you know, uh, the Spirit of God would, uh, would correct them, would lead them, would teach them. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, that God's word will minister uh, uh, to them. Okay. We'll just stop here because it's time. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? Can you hear me? Yes, Pastor, we can hear you. Yeah, okay, yes, thank Pastor. you. Okay. Okay, any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then um, we'll end class. Is Georgia Hamilton in class? Hello, Georgia, are you in class? Okay. Okay, nice to see Zenatoli. Zenatoli, uh, I know there are heavy rains in Nagaland, right? But uh, I was wondering whether you'll have the connectivity, but thank you for joining class. Okay, everyone, um, have a wonderful week ahead. I will see you next week, and we'll just uh, finish up with uh, this lesson six next week. Okay, thank you all for joining class. God bless you all.